world news tonight. Modi for the win. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi has defeated a no-confidence vote in the parliament after a three-day debate. Maui burns. Wildfire rage across Maui as authorities warn that death tolls are expected to rise significantly. Moon race. Russia set to launch first moon lander since 1976 in race to moon with Indian spacecraft Chandrayaan 3. Festive fires. Fireworks light up Wellington's waterfront to celebrate Women's World Cup quarterfinals. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and you are watching World News. We begin with devastating news as wildfires tore through Maui and officials issue a grim warning citing that death tolls are expected to rise significantly. The fire could be the worst natural disaster in Hawaii history. Oh my gosh, look at the harbour. This footage shows the devastation in the coastal resort of Lahaina, Maui's oh largest God. tourist destination. Three wildfires have killed several people and burned down most of the town, fueled by the winds of Hurricane Dora, which passed by some 800 kilometers south of the island. The Coast Guard rescued over a dozen residents who'd run into the ocean to escape the flames and the thick smoke. But too many didn't get out in time. It's going to take years for fix. Years. This is not even the worst of it. Still get dead bodies in the water, floating, and on the seawall. They've been sitting there since last night. We've been pulling people out since last night, trying to save people's lives. And I feel like we're not getting the help we need. Officials said not all the fire had been contained and search and rescue missions continued. Several shelters have been opened to house the thousands of people displaced. President Joe Biden ordered all available federal assets to help with the response. The damage to the infrastructure, it's not just um, buildings. I mean, these were small businesses that invested in Maui. These were local residents. And, uh, you know, we need to figure out a way to help a lot of people in the next several years. A dangerous combination of hurricane winds and drier than normal grasslands appears to have made these wildfires particularly ferocious. This was a home. Conditions exacerbated by climate change, which not only drives up temperatures, but also makes stronger hurricanes more likely. Now, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi has defeated a no-confidence vote in the parliament after a three-day debate. His government was not expected to lose the vote as his Bharatiya Janata Party and its allies have a majority. Opposition leaders say the vote was moved to force him to speak on the ethnic clashes in Manipur state. Mr Modi publicly addressed the violence weeks after it commenced after a video that showed two women being paraded naked by a mob sparked global outrage. The parliament session, which began on the 20th of July, has been marked by protests from the opposition, which demanded that Mr Modi address the House on the violence in the state. Before the no-trust vote, the opposition walked out of the parliament after Mr Modi failed to mention Manipur over an hour into his speech. Late into his two-hour speech, Mr Modi said the federal and the state government were working together to bring back peace in the troubled state. He said he wants to tell the people of Manipur that the country is with them and that they will join hands and find a solution to this challenge together. He also accused the opposition of using Manipur for political games. Mr Modi said they have no faith in the people in India, in the abilities of India, and that they have tried in vain to break the self-confidence of Indians with this no-confidence vote. This is the second time that Mr Modi's government has defeated a no-confidence motion since it came into power in 2014. In 2018, a lawmaker had moved a motion over the issue of granting a special category status to the southern Andhra Pradesh state. It was defeated after a 12-hour debate. Now on to the latest updates from the escalating violence in the war in Ukraine, where a Russian attack on Ukraine's southern city of Zaporozhye killed at least two people, with President Vladimir Zelensky adding that a rescue operation was underway. Windows blown out and a nearby church left damaged. A Russian strike left its mark on this part of Zaporizhia Wednesday. Along with the church, three educational facilities and five residential buildings felt the force of the attack. I was making food and for a second I thought I might go into the other room. I just went out to the corridor and the explosion rang out. At that time, my husband and child were outside. If I had been in the kitchen, I think I would have been injured. She's one of the lucky ones. The strike has shaken this community, and for some, 
it's all too much to bear. Medics worked late into the night treating those left injured in the attack, while emergency teams looked for survivors among the debris. In his lightly address, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky paid tribute to those killed in the strike. Russian terrorists struck Zaporizhia again. There are casualties. Unfortunately, some people have been injured. My condolences to the families and loved ones who have lost their dear ones. The city is just 50 kilometers northeast of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which has been under Russian control since the start of the war. Wednesday's attack puts authorities on high alert once again. Strikes on the plant's surrounding areas have raised persistent fears of a nuclear accident. Border security will be extra tough at the Poland-Belarus borders as Poland will boost the number of troops at its eastern border with Belarus to 10,000 to ward off potential security risks from the Russian ally. Poland has been sounding the alarm on threats that it says neighbouring Belarus poses, warning against provocations. At the edge of the European Union, an uneasy calm for now. This is Poland's border with Belarus, a border that's becoming more and more militarised with the arrival of 10,000 troops to support the border guard. The Polish government is nervous after hundreds of Wagner mercenaries arrived in Belarus at the behest of the country's president, Alexander Lukashenko. He says he's had to restrain Wagner fighters from attacking Poland. While there's no way to independently verify his claims, this week Belarus has been carrying out military exercises near the border. But border guards here insist there's no reason to worry. When we speak with people who live near the border, they are afraid. But we are guarding this border, and as border guards we have no concerns about the Wagner group. Poland also accuses Belarus of using migrants as weapons by letting them cross the border illegally to create tensions within the EU. Thousands of migrants have been stuck in freezing conditions in a buffer zone between the countries. Earlier this week, a Polish official said so far this year 19,000 had tried to make the crossing, up from 16,000 last year. Unending chaos in Niger as new military rulers accused France the country's traditional ally of releasing captured Dijais and breaching a ban on airspace on the eve of a key summit on the Shell's latest crisis. As the regional bloc ECOWAS seeks to resolve the crisis in Niger, the military junta are digging their heels in. On Wednesday, the group responsible for the coup d'etat accused former colonial power France of deliberately attempting to destabilize the country by violating its airspace and releasing several terrorists. These security disruptions, planned by these French forces, as was the case in Mali and Burkina Faso, aim to discredit the CNSP and create a rupture with the people who support it in its actions, or to create a feeling of generalized insecurity in any case. The French Foreign Ministry rejected the claims, adding that the flight had been authorized and coordinated with Niger's armed forces. Today's air movement in Niger was the subject of prior agreement and technical coordination with Nigerian forces confirmed in writing. No attack against a Niger camp has taken place. Since seizing power two weeks ago, the junta has already revoked five military cooperation agreements with France, but Paris has rejected that decision, saying it was not taken by Niger's legitimate authorities. Meanwhile, the U.S. has advised its citizens residing in Niger to keep a low profile and avoid unnecessary movements around town. Following the failed attempt to meet with deposed President Mohamed Bazoum on Monday, Washington has expressed concern over his health and that of his family. They've been detained in the presidential palace since July 26, with rumors they were being held in inhumane conditions. West African leaders are set to weigh their options during Thursday's ECOWAS summit, with diplomacy apparently edging out military intervention for now. We'll be back with more world news after this short commercial break.
Now moving on to the segment on the road to the White House where the 2024 elections appears to be a rematch between President Joe Biden and his predecessor Donald Trump. Despite his mounting legal problems, Mr. Trump is by far the most popular candidate in the Republican field. Author Marine Williamson and anti-vaccine conspiracy theorist Robert F. Kennedy Jr. are challenging Mr. Biden for the Democratic nomination, but they are not considered real threats to the president. The state fair will be a prime event for candidates looking to make their case to the voters. Trump's campaign officially announced that the former president will be attending the Iowa State Fair, putting to rest questions over whether the former president would snub another key Iowa event again. Sid will offer another split-screen moment between himself and DeSantis, who will be attending on the same day. But Republicans say that the dwelling event should be welcomed by the Florida governor. Meanwhile, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis responded to a voters' question in the Iowa that he would be open to using drones or whatever force we need to against drug cartels in Mexico. Russia has successfully launched a spacecraft with the goal of landing on the moon after nearly 50 years. If successful, Russia will be the first to land in the region but faces competition from India in what has become a modern-day space race. The Indian Space Research Organization congratulated its Russian counterpart Roscosmos for successfully launching Luna 25 craft to Moon's South Polar region, the country's first lunar mission in 47 years. The Russian lander is expected to touch down on the Moon on August 21st, 22nd. Russia launched its spacecraft in a bid to be the first country to make a soft landing on the lunar South Polar region, an area believed to hold coveted pockets of water ice. A Soyuz 2.1V rocket carrying the Luna 25 craft blasted off from the Vostochny Cosmodrome. 5,550 kilometers east of Moscow with its upper stage boosting the lander out of Earth's orbit towards the moon over an hour later, Russia's space agency Roscosmos has confirmed. Luna 25, roughly the size of a small car, will aim to operate for a year on the moon's south pole, where scientists at NASA and other space agencies in recent years have detected traces of water ice in the region's shadowed craters. With a mass of 1.8 tons and carrying 31 kilograms of scientific equipment, Luna 25 will use a scoop to take rock samples from a depth of up to 15 centimeters to test for the presence of frozen water. China has decided to lift its travel ban on group tours to a total of 78 countries, including South Korea. Seoul welcomes the move, hoping to bring Chinese group tourists back to the country after more than six years since the so-called Thad retaliation. For the first time in six years and five months, the Chinese government has given the green light for group tours to South Korea. In an announcement made on Thursday, China's culture ministry lifted its ban on group tours to 78 countries, which also includes the U.S. and Japan. It explained that its previous decisions to ease travel restrictions in January and March this year had a positive impact on its tourism industry. At that time, China was allowing group travel to a total of 60 countries following a decision to scrap its zero-COVID measures. However, South Korea was not on the list, with group tours to Korea banned from March 2017 in an apparent retaliation for the country's deployment of the U.S.-made Terminal High Altitude Area Defense, or the THAAD system. The South Korean government welcomes the move, saying it will launch efforts to attract more Chinese tourists. Seoul's culture ministry says it expects the latest announcement to bring life back to the nation's tourism industry, which was hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. To make things more convenient, the government plans to open new visa application centers in Beijing and Shenyang. It had already began resuming its no-visa transfer system for Chinese group tourists to Jeju Island in May. Meanwhile, procedures for Korean tourists applying for Chinese visas will also be simplified. Until the end of 2023, Korean people heading to China for tourism and travel purposes will no longer be required to provide fingerprints. After years of frustration for commuters, the Northern Train Line will finally be fully electric with the implementation of the 10th and final train. 
A thumbs up that's taken the efforts of several successive governments and a whole lot of money and time. The Gawler line is finally about to go fully electric. This is not how you will do a project start to finish, but it's over now, at last. Last month exclusively revealed the delivery of the Gawler line's 10th electric train and today it was unveiled, ready to welcome passengers from Monday, which will also mark the end of the old diesel trains servicing Adelaide's north. The Gawler line is now fully electric with this train completing our train set. The trains are better, they feel smoother. It's a project that's been a long time coming. After on-off talk since 2008, early works finally started in 2018, with funding secured to electrify the line all the way to Gawler. It was slated for completion in late 2020, but it wasn't until mid-2022 when the infrastructure was finally complete. Then there wasn't enough electric trains, so up until now it's been operating a mixture of diesel and electric services. It's been very frustrating as a uni student. It's good that it's here though. Long time coming. Yeah, for sure. And taxpayers have also had to burden huge cost blowouts to get the project finished. The government hoping it will encourage commuters to get back on the train. The people of the north have put up with a lot in waiting for this service. It's been a long journey. There's currently no plans to electrify any other lines. For now, it's just Gawler, Seaford and Flinders. Come back for more news at Stake Around the World. Virgin Galactic's VSS Unity, the reusable rocket powered space plane carrying the company's first crew of tourists to space, has successfully launched and landed. Aboard the spacecraft were six individuals in total, including three private passengers. Indian, Japanese, United States, and Australian Navy vessels arrived in Sydney Harbour ahead of Malabar Navy exercises. India, Japan, United States, and Australia formed the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, or QUAD, as it's more commonly known. Six suspects linked to the assassination of Ecuadorian presidential candidate Fernando Villavicencio have been identified as Colombian nationals. The government said that six men who are in custody are members of criminal organizations. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, who is also a member of the political bureau of the Communist Party of China Central Committee, met with Singaporean Minister of Foreign Affairs Vivian Balakrishnan and the two sides pledging to keep promoting the belt and road construction. Heavy rain drenched North Korea as tropical storm Kanun swept over the Korean Peninsula after prominent Japan, putting Pyongyang on high alert for flood damage. That is all we have for you on World News Tonight. If you miss any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving tonight as fireworks lit up the sky in Wellington's waterfront following the quarterfinals of Women's World Cup. Thank you for watching. Good night.